Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to um, uh, a partnership between TechSoup and QuickBooks Made Easy for Nonprofits. Uh, we do all kinds of webinars for them. Uh, but today's webinar, which is free, uh, it's 90 minutes long. And it is, oh, hello, Pastor Rick um, <laughs> from Arizona. Oh, do you know mm -hmm. him? Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Cool. So this webinar is just for houses of worship and specifically how to deal with pastor payroll. And now, if you don't know me, I am a CPA and I run QuickBooks Made Easy for Nonprofits. And all we do at QuickBooks Made Easy for Nonprofits is teach nonprofits how to use QuickBooks. Um, I do other accounting type uh, trainings just for nonprofits, but I need somebody who knows just about houses of worship, and that's what Barbara is. So Barbara and I are both CPAs, but Barbara, I'll let you introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself, um, and you want to go ahead and share your deck? Um, sure. I'm not really sharing anything, uh, right. and, uh, and at this point, we're at 75 people on the call, so. Awesome. All well, right. welcome, everybody. I am really excited. Um, I have been in business for 30 years as an on-call controller. And a few years ago, I believe I had a calling after I worked for a small church in uh, Casa Grande, Arizona. And um, I had this really heavy feeling that small churches needed what I know. And I am affectionately known in the QuickBooks Made Easy world as the church lady, not the one from Saturday Night Live, but um, just from, from knowing what, um, what churches need. So I'm really excited to be here. I think pastor payroll is probably one of the most confusing um, topics that the churches need to face when it comes to payroll. So I'm really excited that you're all on the call and um, I look forward to having a really fun day with you. Does everybody see my screen over here? Yeah, if you see the screen, let me know in the chat, make sure. Yeah that uh, put it in the chat. Yes, we see the screen. Okay, and there's a little slide to show them how to make it bigger. A little oh, zoom yep. slide yep. in the deck, uh, yeah. Yep. So yeah. Um, to make your, go ahead, you wanna go ahead and- uh, Yeah, if you, if, you, if you roll your mouse around the screen, you'll see this little view thing that's in red up there at the top. And then if you push that, um, you'll be able to push something that says full screen and it'll make the screen full. You'll no longer see the chat but you'll be able to see the full screen, okay? <laughs> so, uh, and then you can um, go back down again if you wanna see the chat. We are going to break, I, I believe in breaks. I don't think, I think it's crazy to think you're gonna listen to us for 90 minutes. <laughs> so we're gonna break in about 40 minutes, we're gonna break. So um, that means that between now and when we break in 40 minutes, um, you will, hopefully we'll have your undivided attention. So don't be looking at your phone. Don't be doing the chat. Don't be like, or you can chat us, but uh, don't text. Uh, don't use Facebook. Don't go to the bathroom. Don't talk to anybody because we'll be able to do all that in 40 minutes. And even though this is free, it's incredibly valuable information. So, all right, Barbara. Okay. Go for um, it. Do you, uh, do you want to mention these things? Yet? Yeah. Yeah. Just okay. real quickly. And I'll bring it up at the end. But QuickBooks Made Easy, uh, we teach nonprofits and houses of worship how to use QuickBooks. And Barbara, with me, has created um, a couple of training products. And we also have a training webinar that's just for nonprofits. I'm sorry, just for houses of worship using QuickBooks. So I think if you go to the next slide, um, the one after that, um, yeah, so this is our two-day webinar series, and I'll bring it up again, uh, but it's, if you're using QuickBooks in your house of worship, that's the exact thing that it's for. We're doing it for desktop users and online users, but let's move past that. Um, and then the next slide, um, we also have discounts on a training product that's on-demand streamable, so you can have it whenever you want. And we also sell tech support agreements just to houses of worship. So, but anyway, we'll talk about that at the end. Uh, so Barbara, just go for it. So what's our agenda? All right. So our agenda for today, obviously we're talking about pastor payroll. We're going to talk first about classification of workers, all workers in houses of worship. Um, and I'll tell you why that's important in just a second. We're going to talk about who can be a pastor. 
going to talk about this uh, term that you might have heard called the dual status. What does that mean? We're going to talk about housing allowances and how to calculate those. Uh, we're going to talk about how to report pastor compensation, options for pastors to pay their taxes, and also uh, we're going to talk about the um, option for opting out of SE taxes. So we're going to have a lot to cover, and I'm, uh, I talk fast anyway, so hopefully um, we'll just, uh, you're going to feel like you've got so much information at the end of this. I hope that you um, feel like it's been a really worthwhile use of your time. So couple let's go ahead. Things. Yep. Real quick, um, just yep. to put this to bed, there's a couple of questions. So a um, couple of people have been asking, so I'll just tell you everybody, I look at the screen. Yes, you will get this deck. It will be given to you. So you will have that handout. And yes, you will also get the recording. Uh, so you will get that, all right, within two days. So don't have to worry about that anymore. All right, awesome. go for it. Perfect. Yep, you bet. All right, so um, we're going to start with the, um, first of all, classification of workers. So I know you're probably thinking, hey, I came here just to learn about pastor payroll, but knowing how we classify workers in our houses of worship is going to be foundational to understanding the concept of dual status. So I want to go through that really quickly. There are basically two classifications of workers. Either you have an employee or you have an independent contractor. An employee is employed by the house of worship. So HOW means house of worship, whereas an independent contractor is actually considered self-employed in their own trader business. And an just, just so you know, we're talking right now, we're not talking about pastors. We're talking about every person who works for your house of worship, including you. All right, go for it. Perfect, yes. So. Um, Generally, when you have an employee, you have some kind of an employment agreement. With an independent contractor, you might have some kind of a um, contractual agreement. The house of worship for an employee controls the schedule of the employee. An independent contractor controls their own schedule. They're the ones with their own uh, calendar. As an employee, the house of worship is there to train and supervise the work. An independent contractor actually generally works without any supervision whatsoever. Um, an employee of, of a house of worship, the house of worship will provide the space, the equipment, the tools that that employee needs to do their job, whereas an independent contractor uses their own equipment. They use their own uh, uh, computer and generally their own space and their own tools. Um, an employee of a house of worship generally gets reimbursed for expenses, right? If they need to go out and get paper or ink for their um, their printer, the house of worship is going to reimburse them. Independent contractors are responsible for their own expenses. They have actually, because they're in a trader business, they have the potential for a profit or loss. That's another um, key indicator that they are, in fact, independent. Um, with an employee, a house of worship determines the pay rates and the pay schedule. With an independent contractor, the independent contractor controls their billing rate, and they need to bill or send an invoice to that house of worship for the work performed in order to get paid. And then finally, the house of worship um, provides benefits, including workers comp for an employee, an independent contractor, the independent contractor is responsible for work comp and their own liability coverage, which is key here because if you have an independent contractor, you should make sure that they're covering themselves for work comp so that the uh, church or the house of worship is not responsible if something were to happen and they um, would get hurt while they are um, working on um, at your location at your house of worship. Okay, so these are um, these are important to know because we have to determine um, we have to know the difference between employees and independent contractors, and it really comes down to three determining factors, but one key word, and that's control. Who controls the financial? relationship, in other words, the pay that the person is going to get, who controls the time and the supervision that that person is going to be working. So do you tell the person when to show up and when they can leave? And the perceived relationship. So if I was to come in and ask a, um, if I was to come in and ask like your accountant and I said, hey, who do you work for? They, they would probably say, I work for myself. I have my own accounting firm. You talk to the bookkeeper in the church, they say, I work for the church. So it's, it's how do they perceive that they work for you? 
And this, this is key. And again, it's foundational to what we're going to um, move on to. Um, when we're reporting compensation, employees, we, um, we give them a W-2, right? Independent contractors or non-employees get a 1099 NEC. NEC, by the way, stands for non-employee compensation. Um, and I will just say one of the pet peeves that I have is that people will say to me, oh, they're a 1099 employee. There is no such thing as a 1099 employee. They are either a 1099 NEC non-employee independent contractor, or they are an employee and they get a W-2. So important that you're not um, mixing those There's because there's no such thing as a 1099 employee, they're either W-2s or they're 1099s, okay? Yeah, and the, the W-2s in general, they're the ones that we withhold on. Mm -hmm. And the 1099s are the ones that we don't. And now Susan brings up a point that a lot of people that are workers are volunteering. <laughs> right. So they don't get either because they're not being paid. But um, I think it's important to acknowledge that a lot of people that are that are actually volunteering their time. Um, yeah, that's actually that's um that's a really good point because um, when it comes to volunteers, the they're technically, I guess you would consider them a non-paid employee because um, for a volunteer house of worship needs to be thinking about what if what happens if this person slips and falls right so they need to have liability insurance on the flip side to that um, you also as a volunteer you kind of control some things about your own schedule like you can literally go well i'm not going to come in today i'm a volunteer you can't really control me so in that case they sort of like um move over to the independent contractor side um and there's some things about doing background checks about volunteers that you need to be really careful about that. You need to get permission to do a background check, but we would want to do background checks, right, on a volunteer because we want them to, um, we want to know what kind of people we're bringing into, let's say, our nursery to watch our children and that kind of thing. So again, I would say that they tend to be more like a um, non-paid employee and they should be um, treated like that. The um, Michelle just mentioned some volunteers, they need to be reimbursed for their materials. Yes, you're right. Those do not go on a 1099. They are not contractors. They're simply being reimbursed for materials spent. Um, and Shunika wanted you to say something about part-time versus full-time employees. Both part and full-time employees go on W-2s. Is there something else that you feel like we need to say about that, Barbara? Well, I think um, what's really important there is a part-time a part-time employee cannot be paid salary um, because that's that is a that's one thing that I see that people say, oh, well, they're a part-time employee, but I'm going to pay them a flat amount. They're technically always have to be hourly. You can restrict their number of hours. You can say I'm only going to pay you for 20 hours, but then you need to have that part-time person only work 20 hours. So be, be careful about that because I do see that in payroll where they'll say, oh, that's a person's salary. But if you divide it out by 2,080 hours, which is 52 weeks at 40 hours a week, they would be making half pay, right? And they wouldn't even be making minimum wage. So be careful about that. So I'm going to, I'm going to have us um, move on. Um, yeah. uh, uh, because I want to make sure we get to what the main point is, which is right. pastor payroll. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Jessica and Rick um, and uh, the cathedral, we will get to you, I promise. Okay. All right. Perfect. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So let's talk about who can be considered a pastor. So uh, first of all, they have to be licensed, commissioned, or ordained as a minister. So be careful about that too. Like you can't just go, oh, well, you know, he's doing this thing, he's doing, uh, he's doing what a pastor would do in our house of worship. If he's not licensed, he or she is not licensed, commissioned, or ordained as a minister, um, then they cannot be considered a pastor. They, need, they are considered a common law employee of a, religious, of a religious body, and they're employed for the purpose of providing ministerial services. And when we talk about ministerial services, ministerial services, we're talking about the administration of sacerdotal functions. So sacraments, they're going to 
uh, do your communion or your mass or um, baptism. Um, in some uh, organizations, your uh, marriage is considered a sacrament. So they're doing the um, ministration of that. Uh, they're conducting the religious worship or they could control, conduct, and maintain the organization. So you could have a pastor of administration as long as they're licensed, commissioned, and ordained, and they're considered a common law employee of a religious body. All right, so we talked about classification, we talked about who can be a pastor. So let's talk about this kind of odd terminology called a dual status. So a dual status means that the pastor is considered an employee for federal and state income tax purposes, but they're, they have the status of being self-employed for social security and Medicare purposes. So how crazy is that, right? So I have a question for you. Which form do you think that a pastor should receive? Okay, just oh, and I on... think I have it on a poll too. Yeah, okay, that'd be perfect. Yeah, thank you. Let me, oh, well, you know what? Uh, I don't have access to the poll. Aretha, can you give me access? Can you upgrade me so I have access to the polls? Yep. Oh, Perfect. she's doing it. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So let's see. What is the role? Oh, this is, oh, what is the role? In, no, can, that, yeah. not, we need to close that poll. That's not the poll. Uh, what about the next one? If not, I don't know. She might okay, have well, put it There's the answering end. in the chat. That's yeah, great. So just so answer in the yeah. chat. Oh, there we go. Then, oh, I have yeah, the so poll. So this now. one, which form yeah. should the pastor receive? A W-2, a 1099 non-employee compensation, both W-2 for salary, a 1099 for housing, either one will work or no clue. Which one do you think? Go ahead and answer, even if you've answered in the poll, if you could just um, click your button over here, which one do you think that we should have? I'm curious where we are. We, okay, so perfect. You're exactly right. All pastors need to get a W-2. Okay, so excellent. Almost 80% of you um, said that. And it seems like both would be a good answer, right? We just said we're dual status. But in reality, um, you're exactly right. Everything is reported on the W-2. And we, they are, um, that's the form that you're always going to use. Okay, good. Thank you. Perfect. I'm just hammering it home. Yeah. Pastors get a W-2. No, they do not get a 1099 under any circumstance. If you're giving them a 1099, you're doing it wrong. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. I love that. <laughs> All right. Let's go to the next thing. And um, this is another area that seems to cause a lot of confusion. So we're going to talk about housing allowances. Okay. So in what I want you to think about when you're thinking about pastor compensation, I want you to think about their compensation as a pie. And housing allowance is really just a piece of the whole pie. So if you say, well, I'm going to pay my uh, pastor $60,000, then a portion of that compensation can be separated out for tax purposes as housing. Um, this is important because I actually had one um, pastor, and you'll see the pastor was actually doing the payroll, which is interesting anyway, but um, he moved to a different house and he uh, got his housing allowance approved and um, the housing was more expensive. So he changed in the payroll system, he changed his housing allowance, but really all that he was supposed to be doing was taking a bigger piece of the pie and the salary portion was supposed to be less. But instead what he did was essentially gave himself a raise. And so we have to be careful when somebody says, I'm going to, I'm going to a new approval for a new housing allowance, that if you think about the pastor compensation as a pie and housing is just a piece of the pie, it's going to be easier for you to wrap your head around the, the fact that if, somebody, if a pastor comes to you and says, hey, I'm moving into a new home or um, uh, and then I want approval for a higher housing allowance, a higher portion of my compensation to be housing, then um, you want to make sure that you're not actually giving that person a raise. You're actually just reducing the size of the salary piece. Okay. You know, that's happened to me too with a house of worship. It's funny that you say that. Is there anybody else that that's happened to where they 
you know, you inadvertently gave the pastor a raise because you, you know, they just, they moved and they decided they want more housing allowance, but the board never really voted on whether or not they should get a raise. Does that ever happen to anybody else? Because uh, it's definitely happened to me. Well, and even if and even if they the board did approve the housing allowance, it's important that when you go back to whether you're doing payroll or you're have an outside service doing payroll, that you go back and say, I want to increase the housing allowance, let's say by $150, but that also means you have to decrease the salary portion. Okay. And, unless they decide that they're giving them a raise, but it's just that it's something that needs to be discussed, doesn't yep. it? Yep. It needs Absolutely. to be was our intention here just because dude moved to a more expensive house we're going to give him a raise i thought we we're giving raises when we want to give a raise not right. because you know she moved to a new house you know <laughs> anyway right. all right okay exactly. go ahead perfect okay so when it comes to pastor compensation i'm going to talk a little bit about taxes and we'll get more and more into this so um just be patient um so when you're thinking about the pie the salary portion is going to be included in income for income tax and self-employment tax purposes. The housing portion, that piece of the pie, is going to be excluded for federal income tax and most states, but not all. Pennsylvania, I believe, is one of them where you actually are, uh, the pastor is taxed on the housing, but it, it, but it is subject to self-employment tax this is really important okay and then benefits may be taxable for both income tax and se tax and in a sense they actually are just part of compensation and we're going to talk about what's included in compensation um, coming up but i do want to mention that because i also see uh, houses of worship giving benefits to their pastor that they think, well, they shouldn't necessarily be taxable, but they really are. So um, we're going to talk about that in an upcoming slide. But just keep that in mind when you're when you're dealing with benefits, they may be taxable for both income tax and self-employment tax. So let's talk about taxes. Um, there are actually four, basically four types of taxes that every employee pays, right? You know them as federal income tax, state income tax, social security tax, and Medicare tax. Generally, a regular employee is going to have all of these things withheld from their, uh, from their paycheck, right? And they don't have to worry about any of that because their social security and Medicare, which by the way, might be called FICA, you probably have heard that term, the employer takes care of all of that. But that's not the situation with pastors. Pastors are under a uh, different reporting requirement, and that is that they pay SE tax. You might have heard SICA is another, or that, that's a self employment um, portion that's the equivalent to FICA taxes. But in reality, what that is, what um, SE tax is, is the, the pastor is going to pay not only their social security, um, the, the social security and Medicare that the house of worship would have withheld from a typical employee, but they're also going to pay um, the employer match. So they're actually responsible for both sides of social security and Medicare. So we're going to talk about that too. So don't get um, don't get ahead of me, but we will talk about that as well. I'll but just say you know, I'll yeah. just say that real quick, just to make sure for those of you that don't know. So, like Barbara said, there's federal, state, Social Security, and Medicare tax. The Social Security and Medicare tax, if you add them together, well, it, it's fifteen point three percent of wages, and everyone in this country, when you make money you're paying 15.3% into the government, okay? 12.4 um, goes to Social Security, 2.9 goes to Medicare. If you work from someone else, if you work for somebody else, you pay half, it's taken right off your W-2, your employer matches it. If you work for yourself, like an independent contractor does, you pay 
both shares and it's called self-employment tax, all right? Pastors, even though they go on a W-2 like they're an employee, when it comes to social security, they don't have it withheld. They pay it through self-employment tax like independent contractors do, okay? So they're kind of employees, kind of independent contractors. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that clarification. That was great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about how do we determine a housing allowance. Um, so, um, oh, well, first of all, let me just read this. This is straight from the IRS. It says a minister's housing allowance, sometimes called a parsonage allowance or a rental allowance, is excludable from gross income for income tax purposes, but not excludable for self-employment tax purposes. So even though um, the, the, so the point is that the housing allowance, um, you're not gonna pay federal and in most states, state income tax, but it is going to be subject to that SE or self-employment tax, okay? All right, so let's talk about how do we calculate how much can we, how big of that, how big of a piece of pie can we give to our pastor as a housing allowance. And Pat, right? I want Pat, I want you to listen to this in particular. Pat has a question. Pat has someone that just gets a housing allowance of 20,000 and doesn't get a W2 at all. Or they don't get any wages. Only thing they're compensated on is their housing allowance. So Gotcha. That's probably a problem. But anyway, go ahead. Yep. Well, we, yeah, we'll talk about that. So All we're right. going to talk about the lesser of three. This is really key because I was um, teaching this to another group and there, was, there were a few light bulbs that went on. They said, I had no idea that there was a lesser of three uh, requirements. So I want you to really um, grasp this. The first way that we can determine a housing allowance is based on actual expenses. And when we're talking about actual expenses, we're talking about the uh, mortgage principal and interest, the real estate taxes, homeowners insurance, the HOA fees, utilities, repairs, yard maintenance, but not cleaning your house, by the way, um, uh, buying furniture, appliances, even a down payment in the year of purchase. Wow, that's a lot of expenses that seem like they can be housing allowance. But remember, it's the lesser of three because we, the next re, uh, thing that we're going to look at is fair rental value. So this is if it was a furnished home plus utilities. So what would your home, if you were to rent it, furnished, plus the utilities, is that amount more or less than your actual expenses? Okay. And then finally, board designated. So your board may say that um, we're only going to give a certain amount for, um, for housing allowance. That's not very common, I would say. But some would say, it, um, some boards would say, we just don't think it's being very good. Uh, you're being a very good steward if 100% of your compensation is going to pay for your housing. And so we're only going to give you a percentage, kind of like going and getting a mortgage, right, from a bank, where they're saying, yeah, we're not going to give you, if you're only making $20,000, we're not going to give you a mortgage that the payment on that mortgage is $20,000 a year, right? They're going to go, no, it's got to be around 35% of your total income. However, the board has to really think about that because if the board knows that pastor is married or maybe that pastor it has uh, a, a, an additional job outside of the church, all of that needs to be taken into consideration. So just know though that you actually can have three different uh, parameters to look at when you're looking at the lesser of three when determining that how big that piece of a pie is gonna be. So one of the best things that you can do is create a housing allowance worksheet. Allow the pastor to fill in what they're estimating to be their actual expenses. And then how are you gonna get the other two? Well, the board designated, that one's pretty easy because if the board says, hey, we're only gonna um, approve up to a certain percentage, or we're only going to approve a certain amount, they can plug that number in. But the fair rental value or this fair market value of that home takes 
that um, it really requires that somebody on the board takes the time to do a little research to say, okay, this is a 2000 square foot home in this community. And are there any rentals out there furnished plus utilities to come up with a number that seems reasonable or fair in comparison to what the pastor is asking for, okay? And then you look at the three, which one is the lesser of, the lesser of three, which of these is the least amount, circle it, let's say that it is the actual amount, and then you have the um, board sign and date that worksheet, and, um, and that becomes the housing allowance that becomes approved. I just think this is a, I actually created this for um, my Good Steward Church Academy. I founded that a few years ago, and um, they loved this because they could take that and and actually go through this with their board, with the pastor, and um, is in compliance with, with what we're teaching here today. So Carol says, um, and Carol, I'm just gonna read this for people. She's yeah. agreeing with you. She's saying the board can improve any amount um, to pay, but the minister can only shelter the lesser of three on the minister's tax return. So I think what she's saying is, say you have a board that's just like, well, this is what their compensation is going to be. And then based on the lesser of three, we got to figure out what the housing allowance is. Now, one thing I would add, Carol, is that as a board, you, you as, as, a, as a house of worship, you can't just leave it up to the minister to determine the housing allowance. You need to be in the game here because as we'll see in a minute, the compensation, the, the, the salary is reported in one way and the housing allowance is ported, reported in a different way on the forms you give him on the W-2. So if you don't know how they're splitting it, that's a problem. So you have to get in the dirt with them. And yes, Daryl, um, we're going to send you a copy of this worksheet that Barbara mm -hmm. made. Okay. Awesome. Perfect. All, All right. right. Okay, so a couple of reminders about housing allowances. Um, the first is that the housing allowances must be formally designated and recorded in advance. And secondly, they may not be established and change retroactively. So if you bring a pastor on, let's say in March and the worksheet isn't filled out and you know a, pa a payroll goes by, they can't go backwards, right? Um, you can't go back and go, oh, well, my actual expenses were higher than I thought they were. So can I just go have you change and go back and change my salary and my housing allowance split all the way back to January? And here we're in October. No, can't do that. So it's always established. It, it, it's always um, once it's determined and approved, it's always on the next paycheck that you can make those changes. Cool. Yeah. So um, um Somebody was even saying here, Bruce was referring to somebody else, and he was like, yeah, it's more problematic if there is a retroactive housing allowance. And it's like, we actually can't have retroactive housing allowances. <laughs> exactly. So, all exactly. Right. Yeah. If, if they haven't filled out the form, if the board hasn't approved it, it nothing gets changed until that happens. So, which is a, a good reason to have that worksheet um, and the signing and the dating of that and make it part of your bringing on a new pastor uh, procedure to make sure that all of these uh, things happen. Just like you need to get a, a W-4 and an I-9 for a pastor, you're going to have a housing allowance worksheet. Um, so uh, good. So going back and to... Yeah, go I do want to say just one more thing, just to make sure, because this is important about what she's about to say. So I just want to make sure you understand. There's federal income tax, there's state income tax, and then there's that self-employment tax, all right? The salaries are subject to both. The housing allowance can be excluded from income tax, but it's still subject to self-employment tax. Now, if you have questions about how we report it or how they pay it, we're gonna get to that later. Right now, just understand housing allowances can be excluded from um, income tax, all right? Except, and then she's going to show you the exception, all right? All right. right. Thank you. Yeah. So what we're talking about here is, okay, so the 
uh, pastor has filled out the form, the, the board has approved it, everything's rolling along just fine. And then everybody thinks the housing allowance is perfectly done, but there are exceptions to whether you can actually have a housing allowance for that full amount. So we're, this is straight off the IRS uh, website. And this is exactly how it reads. It says, if your housing allowance exceeds the lesser of these three things, one, if it's not reasonable, right? If you live in the, it, if, um, if it's not reasonable compensation for the type of uh, position that you have, that's going to um, be an exception. If the fair rental value of the home is um, less than the housing exclusion, and or if your actual expenses that directly relate to providing the home, if you if you exceed if your allowance exceeds your actual expenses, then you must include the amount of the excess in income. So what a lot of um, pastors will do is they will go through and they're going to estimate how much their utilities are and their their um, you know various things that that we talked about as far as their actual expenses, and then even to the point that. Um, their tax advisor might even say to them, well, just buffer that up a little bit, you know, buffer it up by 10% so that just in case you have some extra expenses that happen, um, that you are, um, that, that you're covered. Well, let's say those extra expenses don't happen. Now you've taken out more housing allowance, you've made the pie, the piece of the pie bigger than your actual expenses, and we're assuming that your actual expenses are actually less than the fair rental value, right? And but that excess needs to be added to the pastor's um, income for income tax purposes. So then the question comes up: Well, how is that pastor going to know that? So one suggestion would be have your housing allowance, and in most cases you can do this through any of your payroll companies. Have your housing allowance portion put it into a totally separate account, like, a, like a, a second checking account, and then pay all of your housing, qualified housing expenses out of that account. If you have money left over at the end of the year, that's the amount that is um, gonna be an exception. That's the amount that's in excess of your actual expenses. That's one way to do it. Another question that comes up is the um, person doing the payroll or reporting the payroll, they'll say, do I need to find that out from the pastor at the end of the year? And the answer to that is actually no. That is the pastor's responsibility to first determine whether they um, whether their housing allowance exceeded the actual amount and to report any excess housing allowance on their own personal tax return. So I want to, I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Lisa said that account is brilliant, by the way. Um, uh, just, I wanted to point out here, we were talking about the housing allowance and there are, you do the lesser of three to determine what the housing allowance is. And then Barbara just gave an example of, if it turns out that the lesser of three and what you're gonna go with is the actual expenses, but then what, then you just gave them money and you didn't, you didn't, it turns out you gave them more than the expenses were then you're then there. That's the problem. But again, you don't have to worry about it. They just have to report it when they do their um, their do their tax return. But if you have these other people that are just paying, they've decided that they're just going to go with the fair rental value of the home. Mm -hmm. Then, I guess unless they inflated the fair rental value of the home, there probably wouldn't be a problem. It's something Correct. they check right. at the mm -hmm. end of the year. Right. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I got it. I got it. Cool. Um, all right. And so, I'm saving these questions, by the way, that people are sending so that I can, awesome. when you get to a point where it makes sense to stop, we can do the questions. Perfect. All right. all Actually, right. this is um, probably a good place to take a break because we're going to move on to a new topic. Oh, right, okay. Um, and let me just go tell you what we're going to talk next about is actually reporting pastor compensation. So do you want to take a five minute break? Let's, and... let's do the questions real quick and then we'll okay, take sure. a five minute break because I know okay. these people are asking. So um, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll wait on that. Um, 
This was a random question. How do churches access the background data bank? I'm not sure what that even means. So in terms of, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe they're asking about the fair rental value. One of the best ways to do that is um, call up a realtor or a property manager and in your community and say, hey, I'm looking for a 2000 square foot home that's furnished. Um, and you know, I'm just curious, what would my rental value be? Right? Okay. What would my rental what rent be? So that would be one way to do it. Usually there's somebody in the church that's actually a realtor and can probably do that for you um, and would probably do it as a volunteer. <laughs> uh, does the self-employment tax only apply in the case of the pastor if he files self-employment tax? And that what, what we've learned is that the pastors, I mean, it, it, unless they opt out of doing self-employment tax, which we're going to get to, then yeah, they absolutely, self-employment tax always applies. Um, right. All right. Um, okay. Uh, our nonprofit is a 501c3 mission agency. Two of the employees are also ordained ministers. They do not provide any sacro sacerdotal functions. They just administer the mission agency. Should they be classified as a minister for reporting purposes? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I have had... Um, I've gotten actually uh, answers that, yeah, they can still be if they they can still be considered a pastor if the mission organization is under the um, is a, like a sister uh, organization to an actual church and they're when they're going out in the mission field they're actually doing some of those sacerdotal duties or um, performing the um, performing the religious services, but other than that. Um, if it's a completely separate organization, um, they sh really should not be paid as a pastor um, and yeah. that the housing allowances would not be applicable at all. Right. So the, if, if they're not doing any sacerdotal functions, which is what this person said, then forget about it. Yeah. All right. Um, they're just like everybody else. They're an employee. Yep. So, um, Pat, I think you got your question answered. Um, uh, yeah, and that was a different thing uh almost done here does the housing allowance need to be approved by the board before january 1st or can it be updated at fiscal year oh yeah when do they have to have the housing allowance so, approved? so that's actually a great question um it doesn't uh, most of the time the um you know they'll kind of review your uh pastor will probably be reviewing their housing allowance in comparison to their taxes but Technically, it doesn't have to be done at any particular time because remember, we're just dealing with how big of my pie is going to be housing, how big of my pie is going to be salary, and that can happen at any time during the year. And it doesn't affect the church's share of payroll taxes, so it has nothing to do with the budget either. So um, the pastor could change it every month or every six months if they're if they are in a short-term lease, for example. Hopefully that's not happening. It's just that they have, they have to budget. approve it. They just have to approve right. it. Just has to be approved. Yep. Okay. If a church provides the pastor a house with all the expenses are paid, so the pastor doesn't actually pay any expenses, then is yeah. the housing allowance equal to the fair market value of the housing? I think so. Yeah. So the housing allowance is the fair market value of that parsonage or that home that the um, church is providing. Um, and if the uh, church is paying for all of those um, expenses related to that um, to that parsonage, then like the utilities and everything ends up being um, additional income. That's considered uh, like basically an in-kind uh, housing allowance where you're not getting the cash to pay for your own home, but you're getting the value of that home yeah. as compensation. I was just thinking that, that in terms of the rule of three, you know, the lesser of three, technically the pastor's expenses are zero, but what we're talking about, I guess you'd be comparing the expenses that were paid on behalf of the pastor mm -hmm. to the fair rental value. Whenever one's mm -hmm. less, that's the one you'd go with. Mm -hmm. That would be the lesser three. The third being if the board decided a percentage. Um, uh, and then this was the other question. This is just asking it again. If you give the pastor a free parsonage as part of his compensation along with the utilities, that's the same question, isn't it? Yeah, so it's not free. They still have to be, report that they received a value 
of the house that they're living yeah. in. Yeah. And then, yes, Susan, we are going to talk about how to record uh, in QuickBooks. So let's go ahead and take um, a five minute break. That's great. Uh, Debbie is saying she realizes she's been doing everything wrong. So, uh, yeah, I would probably just start fresh uh, in January of 2020. Three. Uh, you know what? You probably, yeah, in January 2023, you could probably issue a W-2 for 2022, Debbie. You could probably do that. Um, all right, cool. So most people are back. Um, oh. Yeah, and it looks like so, most people just have a few, but uh -huh. like 17% Perfect. have a bunch. Awesome. So Okay. Well, we're going to mention that um, in our next section, but that's that's good to know. So thank you for that. All right, we are uh, moving on into how do you actually report pastor compensation. But before we do, a couple of questions that I saw, um, I think it was uh, Shanika, I don't know if I said that right. Um, you asked about, um, you were a little confused on the FICA. So a typical employee has half of that FICA withheld, so Security Medicare was withheld, and then the employer matches it. That's the exact same way that is handled in the church. So um, yeah, so it's not, they pay in, the church pays in the full 15.3%, but they got half of it out of the employee's paycheck as a withholding. Um, Carol, you asked about IRS um, regulations and a publication for that. I um, will give you that at the end. Um, Professor Quick, thank you for um, uh, telling us that that's a good thing to take a break. <laughs> and um, Mike, you asked the question, if they're employees, why don't they have, um, why, why are we doing it this way, right? And that is a really good question. Um, the IRS loves to make things difficult, but the primary reason is to save uh, taxes, have for, that the pastor is actually saving taxes. They, in a sense, get to double dip on their housing, right? They're, they're, the housing allowance is not subject to federal income tax, yet they can still take a deduction for their mortgage interest, on their personal tax return. Um, there, a few years ago, there was a group called Freedom Against Religion and they tried to fight that uh, really big and um, they lost. But, and so that housing allowance has been retained, but um, that, was a big, that was a big part of it is that why should pastors have this preferential treatment um, and not have to pay federal income tax on their housing allowance? So uh, great question, but um, that's the primary reason. Um, okay. Um, okay. So I think that's, those are the main ones that I got. So let's go ahead and move on to how do we report uh, pastor compensation? So we're going to look at the form W-2 because all pastors compensation needs to be on a form W-2, right? We talked about that. So in box one is going to be the pastor's total compensation not including housing allowance. And I specifically worded it as total compensation rather than salary, because you may have benefits that are also taxable. So uh, we're gonna talk about that in a second, but um, so box one, total compensation, but not the housing allowance, not that piece of the pie. Boxes three, four, five, and six should either be left blank or show zero for pastors. So um, box three is your social security wages. Box four is your Medicare wages. And of course, since those are not taxable for FICA tax purposes, there's going to be no social security withheld and no Medicare tax withheld. Okay. The, I just want to, um, yeah. I want to, I think this might be a good time to, because yep. Mike had asked, um, you know, why do pastors pay SE tax when they are employees of the church? Like, in other words, why can't we have on the things that they have to pay self-employment tax on, like um, the uh, uh, the compensation and the housing allowance, why can't we just have the withholding right in the social security boxes there and let the... Um, let the church take care of that like they do for the other employees because they are going to be paying 
essentially Social Security and Medicare. So why do we not do it on the W-2? Why do we have them pay it separately? Why is that? Yeah. So if you don't, if you, um, if you pay them like any other employee, then they are not entitled to that housing allowance. Ah. That's the whole reason. Okay. That, that negates that housing allowance um, exemption um, from all that housing allowance that needs to be in box one. The I thing is, is like yeah. they gave you something and they took it away because they took something else away. Because what they said was your compensation, the housing allowance portion, you don't have to pay income tax on, but you have to pay both shares of FICA on everything. Yep. Right? Yep. Um, because if they if they did it like Mike was saying, and let's just put Social Security on there, then you'd probably be matching half of it. So it's yep. kind of like you pay more in Social Security and Medicare wages, unless you opt out, which is coming up, but you pay less in income tax because, you know, you don't have to pay income tax on your compensation. Well, I mean, let's, you know, yeah, and let's think about your, that. You would have paid seven housing points. Allowance. Whoops, sorry. I said um, it wrong. You wouldn't pay tax on your housing allowance. Okay, go ahead. Correct. Yes, sorry. The, um, if you think about it too, you, um, if you have, depending on your uh, federal tax rate, right, you could be anywhere from, let's say, 15 to 30 percent um, for income tax purposes, but for social, but for SE tax purposes, the 7.65 you were going to pay anyway. So you're really only paying 7.65 on that entire housing allowance. So, yeah. um, and, you know, and your other option is say, okay, I just don't want to be considered a pastor and I won't take that housing allowance. But that, that doesn't seem like a very smart thing to do, you know, financially for the pastor. Um, and you're just, by the way, when we get to the whole tax thing, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but there's a little benefit that you may not know about. Um, so it's not really even as bad as 7.65%. So hold tight on that and we'll talk about that. Okay. So, um, Again, box one, total compensation. Box three, four, five, and six should be blank or say zero. And in box 14, that's where we're gonna put the housing allowance. This is informational only, but it's important to give your pastor um, the amount that you had um, given, paid him for the housing allowance, because remember, it's up to the pastor to figure out if he has more housing allowance or she has more housing allowance than they're the actual expenses. So they need that number in order to make that determination. And then uh, the last thing is box 16. Um, generally, the amount in box 16, which is your state income tax, is generally the same as box one, unless your housing allowance is taxable in your state. And I, I'm pretty sure Pennsylvania, um, it is taxable. So they would actually need to add the box one plus the box 14, and that would equal um, your box 16. But most states, I would say, are, um, are not taxable. For that. Wow. Is there anybody from Pennsylvania here? Do you know whether or not, if you're from Pennsylvania, that housing allowances are actually taxable in the state of Pennsylvania? Yep. Carol yep, says. Yep. Yep. yep that's what All I right. thought. Okay, perfect. So what are we going to include in box one of the W-2? This is, this is where we're going to talk about that total compensation for purposes of box one, okay, on the W-2. So salary and bonuses, that's logical, right? The, um, so again, the, the piece of the pie that we're um, calling salary, cash and gift cards. If you, um, anytime we give a cash equivalent, and this is true whether you're a pastor or an employee, anytime we give a cash or gift card to an employee, that's considered taxable. Um, reimbursed FICA or reimbursed personal insurance. And I wanna to touch on this because I see this in a lot of houses of worship. Where Karen, go, Karen, I hope you're listening. This is exactly the question you asked. Oh, so good. go ahead. Good, perfect. So a lot of um, houses of worship will say, well, that's not really fair. We would have paid the 7.65 for every other employee. So we're just going to reimburse. We're going to calculate what that 7.65% is. And we're going to reimburse our pastor for our share of the FICA. Guess what? That needs to be added to box one. Um, because it's not a reimbursement of 
business expenses, it's actually giving them personal income. Same thing with personal insurance. I have um, a pastor that um, sort of aged out of the health insurance. Uh, he had now he and his wife actually are both employed by the church and they were now on Medicare. And so um, he goes, hey, I'm not going to be on the health insurance anymore because I can get Medicare. Um, but could you reimburse me for my personal insurance? Box one income. OK, so any kind of reimbursement that is for uh, personal expenses, like a personal insurance, is taxable in box one. Non-accountable allowances, another big area that I see. Um, they'll say, we're just going to give our pastor $300, um, either a paycheck or a month for um, a car allowance. But you don't have to tell us whether you drove for, uh, for church purposes. Any non-accountable allowance, any non-accountable allowance where they don't have to tell you what they spent the money on is um, box one income. Um, honorarium. So a lot of times um, houses of worship will pay um, or have uh, their parishioner pay even um, for the performance of a sacerdotal duty or for a wedding. So um, the pastor gets paid his normal um, or her normal compensation. and then oh, they did a wedding this week, and they either get that from the bride and groom or the church pays them an extra honorarium, let's say, of $200, and that needs to be added to box one, okay? Um, anytime we're adding income to the pastor, it doesn't go on a 1099, it gets added to box one income. Just know and that too. The let me IRS add this, hates that. Go ahead. Let me add this too, because somebody had asked, this is Lisa, uh, a, a required pension contribution at 18% to a third party, how would you handle that? So they're basically putting, a, 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 their, the church is giving extra money to their retirement plan. Is that considered income? Yeah, so that's a good question. So if you are putting money into a, um, a retirement plan that is not your house of worship group qualified, 401k, 403b, simple IRA, it's a completely separate um, uh, account that is 100% box one income. Mm -hmm. And they, and they shouldn't, and, and keep in mind that that's not even considered tax deferred money either because you're putting money into an account that's not your qualified account. I had, I had that happen in a, in a small church as well. They're like, well, they came in, he said he already has an account, we're just going to put that money in. Well, that money is actually taxable to him now, and it's going to come out as taxable if he's putting it into his old uh, retirement plan. So you got to be really careful about that. That is really messy for the pastor. A couple um, of questions on the honoraria. Yeah. These are just people kind of highlighting, and you'll appreciate this because of your next topic, but mm -hmm. um, the honoraria in box one only if it's paid by the church. And then Correct. this other person, it's called operations admin. If the honorarium is given them directly from an individual, how we would, how we would, how would we track that? And would we be responsible to report it? The answer is no. You don't track that at all. Right. These are just gifts. Yep. You right. know. So right. if they give it to the church, and then the church gives it to the pastor, well the reason why they're giving it to the church for one is so they can write it off on their taxes. But now it becomes money that um, is part of the compensation of uh, the pastor. Whereas if I just walked up to the pastor and gave him money, that's just me giving him money. That's like, you know, when I drive down the road and give somebody money that's, you know, asking for money on the side of the road, so. Right, and if, the, if, um, if that pastor goes to another um, house of worship as a guest pastor and they pay an honorarium, that, uh, that does get reported if it's more than, if, he makes more than $600, they're, he's going to get a 1099 from that other church. We're talking about, um, I guess, in um, internal um, extra yeah. money. If they get yeah. money, if, if, basically, if they get money from something that's not the church, either it's an individual that's in your church, mm -hmm. or it's an individual that's not in your church, or it's a church that's not your church, not your problem, okay? Correct. It's the stuff that's coming from your church. Um, and then the final one is, um, and this is, this is important because in a lot of houses of worship, 
uh, Pastor Appreciation Month is in October, so this is perfect timing to understand this. Um, pastor Appreciation, love offerings, um, specific uh, 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 collections that you take for that purpose, taxable, part of your box one income. So what happens here, and again, to Greg's point, if you say, hey, it's Pastor Appreciation Month, let's show our pastor our love, and the person sends you know, a $20 bill and a card and says, thank you for your service, you don't have to worry about that. But if the person uh, writes a check and says, for pastor appreciation for $20, now we have to deal with that in the church. And one of the ways that you can deal with that is by creating what I call a designated fund. And the designated fund idea is that we're gonna set this money aside um, and put it into what I call a fund bucket. And so the money is gonna come into this designated fund called love offerings. And then it's going to, once we accumulate the amount that needs to get paid to our pastor, it's gonna go out of that bucket um, and to the pastor. So uh, this is a great place to use designated funds. And that was why we asked the question, you know, do you have designated funds? So if you do have, it looks now like most of you have a few, this would be a great place to use that designated funds. It's kind of like the money comes in and the money goes back out. And we go into a whole training on this um, in our House of Worship uh, training, QuickBooks for House of Worship training. Yeah, remember we were talking about there is uh, training coming up next month. Um, and we're going to, it's uh, it's a it's a training just for Houses of Worship. We're going to do it once for people using QuickBooks desktop. And again, for people using QuickBooks online. And we're going to go through everything you need to know about using QuickBooks for a house of worship. But a big piece of that is how to deal with these funds. Okay. Yes. So I've also been called to task by three or four people uh, who are saying, if you go to another church and you get an honorarium from that other church, it's not a gift. Um, if they say, we're going to give you an honorarium because you did this, that's a fee for a service. You should get a 1099 if it's over $600. And the pastor has to report that on their taxes. I totally agree. If I said that whenever you get money from a honorarium from another church, it's a gift. No, it could be if, they, if you didn't charge a fee and they just gave you something at the end, that'd be one thing. But if it was agreed upon what the fee was going to be at the beginning, then yes, it's taxable to them. My point was the money came from another church, so it's just not relevant to your right, church. For your you house of worship, you don't have to add it to their W-2, but you are exactly right. If um, that amount wasn't $600, it is still the pastor's responsibility to record that as income. Even if it's not reported to the IRS, they're supposed to pick that up as income for services rendered. So um, that is true. Yep. What if the funds, pastor appreciation, are used to purchase a gift are gifted as a donation on their behalf. Does that need to be reported online? Any, yeah, any cash equivalent that's given to an employee of any role in the church, any cash equivalent is considered income. Gift and Ron, card, gift, anything. Yep. Ron is still disagreeing with me. So Ron says, if I say I'm going to go over to the church and I'm going to do a service for you, and I don't want to be paid. I have no interest in being paid. And we don't agree upon a price. And then they say, I'm giving you this money for your services at the end. The, she, he's saying that's taxable. I disagree with you, Ron. I think if you decided you were going to do it for free, they can say they're giving it to you for services rendered. But if they, if you said you were doing it for free and they gave you money anyway, and as far as I'm concerned, it's a gift. I disagree with you. And I do about 250 individual tax returns a year. But Carol agrees with Ron, but I'm always right. Um, so <laughs> therefore, that's the end of it. <laughs> well, I kind of, I agree with Ron too, but I don't do taxes. And that's one of the reasons I don't do it. Because I like, mm, yeah. So yeah. Jim it's, says it's true. The pastor has to report gifts because he is in the business. Business, yep. I don't, I'm sorry. Gifts are not taxable. I'm sorry. I'm, I just, I know that I'm right, but <laughs> go ahead. Judy agrees with help. Maybe it's something just for pastors. Maybe I don't know, but that's. Well, because it's a common, it's, here's the thing. It's a common um, thing to bring in guest pastors to 
um, what they call, uh, they actually call it pulpit supply, to supply the pulpit with a pastor because you, your main pastor is out on vacation. And so even though you say, oh, well, I'll do it for free, you're doing a service and your main business, your main business, if you will, is preaching, then that is. So, um, yeah. All right. I don't want to, okay. I don't want to do yeah. yeah. No, yeah. I've changed my mind. I agree yep. with y'all now. Yep. Everybody, yep. now I understand it more. So, <laughs> um, All right. The IRS does we, not consider these gifts. I agree with that. Yep. Okay. I was wrong. I thought yep. I was always right. Well, that's the one time. <laughs> All right, so Susan, All right. Uh, Susan is saying she loved those fun buckets. Um, she started learning, uh, she started using them. And then Karen says she went through the training last year and she learned so much and she highly recommends it for anyone. Oh, good. Right. Thank you All so right. much for that, that uh, vote. I love that. Let's keep going. Right. Okay, so um, we're now we're going to move on to options for pastors to pay their taxes. So, okay. So first of all, I want to talk about SE taxes. How are those reported? Okay, so we don't have them withheld, right? But we have to report them um, on our, uh, the pastor needs to report them on his personal tax return. So his personal tax return is a form 1040 and it's reported on a form called, get that, a schedule SE for self-employment tax. So um, right now, if you know nothing else, um, you need to know that you're not going to be able to file a 1040 EZ because you're, you're gonna have to add these schedules um, to your tax return. So you're gonna have your regular, you know, two-sided 1040. You're gonna have a schedule called a Schedule SE to report your self-employment tax. Um, you're gonna report that as income. Big mistake that people make, they think, oh, I need to put this on a Schedule C. No, <laughs> no, we're not putting our housing allowance on a Schedule C. We are putting our entire compensation, the whole pie, onto a Form SE. That, um, assuming that's the only thing that to would total down uh, to this line, and then it would go on a Schedule Two, which is the additional taxes that we need to pay. And this is the little uh, bow on this thing. Um, oh, then, oh, sorry. So one, one step further. So the SE taxes, then there's a special line on the uh, 1040 form on the back side that says additional taxes. So the total that came off of our schedule two um, gets uh, put on to uh, this line on the, uh, to a line on the back of your 1040. And then here's the little bow on this thing that I said, remember I said earlier that, well, technically it isn't, 15.3%. That's because when you do the SE tax, at the very bottom of this, they say, what's 50% of that amount? And you get to take that number onto a Schedule 1, and you get to deduct 50% of your SE taxes as an adjustment to your income. And that looks like this. It goes actually on the front page as an adjustment of income. So it actually lowers your adjusted gross income on your personal tax return. So it sounds, um, I know this is a whole bunch of stuff. I don't actually do personal income taxes, but I wanted you to know that because um, sometimes the board is sitting there going, wow, they're having to pay this extra amount. Again, seven points, I'll rather pay 7.65% on my housing allowance than 24%. But they all, but um, you also get this little 50% reduction of your adjusted gross income. 50% of your SE tax actually comes back to you. So in a sense, you're not even paying um, that full 7.65%. Okay, Is that helpful? So, yeah, that's just a huge. It's just basically uh, Barbara showing us what the pastor has to do when she or he fills out the tax. Not something you have to worry about unless you're or in this call and you're a pastor. But anyway, go ahead. So Ken is saying um, that the net effect of that is instead of paying 15.3%, um, the effective rate is more like 14.3%. Yep. yep, yep. Yep. And 7.65 would have been yours anyway, if you were a, a typical mm -hmm. employee. Okay. Ken, Ken must be an accountant. All right, I go ahead. I love it. Thank you for um, <laughs> calculating that for me. All right, so um, let's move on to our options. So option one for paying the taxes, 
um, is to do what we call estimated tax payments. It's a form 1040 ES. There's four of them because they are paid quarterly. But um, estimated taxes have the weirdest dates. So if you don't know, your first one um, of the first quarter is due April 15th of the current year. June 15th is the second one. Let's think about that. That's only two months later and it's due, right? Then from June 15th to September 15th is your third 1040 ES is due. And then they say, oh, just in case you get a bonus at the end of the year, you might have some extra taxes that need to be paid. So we'll give you till January 15th um, to make sure you pay your taxes um, for the whole year. And you do not want to be short. Um, as a matter of fact, the IRS expects that you will pay at least 100% of all the taxes that you owed in the prior year, plus 10% in the next year, because they assume that you're going to probably have um, an increase. So just know these dates are really important to know. If you're late, um, there's penalties for those. And a lot of people just don't know that. They think a quarter, well, they're quarterly. They even call them quarterly estimated tax payments. And they're going, OK, March 31st, April makes sense. But June 30th, I got to pay this two weeks early, two weeks before the end of the quarter. September, I'm paying two weeks before the end of the quarter. And then I get 15 days at the end of the year. It's the craziest um, calendar, but that those are the dates. So keep that in mind. Well, hold um, on. Let me go. Let yeah. me go back to that just for a yeah. second. Mm -hmm. So if you do option one, this mm -hmm. is a pastor would decide to do this. And I'm wondering, my guess is, Barbara, and you can speak to this. I'm, I'm thinking a lot of pastors don't really do this or they don't know how to do it. So they're asking the church to help them out with this. And, and, and so that's why she's kind of talking about this, because you go online and get these forms and then you give them to the pastor and say, OK, it's time to pay your taxes. Now, they may say, well, you know, can you just like take it out of my check for me and pay it on my behalf? And that's what option two is for. And by the two. way, this yep. is this is all your taxes. This would be your federal, your state or not your state. The state has their own estimate tax payment, but the yep. federal and the Social Security, Medicare, or FICA, or uh, self-employment tax. tax. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Right. You take your whole total tax, and you could look at last year, and you go, whoop, I need to pay one-fourth on these dates in the current year plus 10%. So you could do it that way. Um, yeah, I would say the majority of my pastors have gotten a little bit smarter about that, because when these dates hit, if they haven't set that money aside, that can be a really big hit um, to their family finances. So um, instead, they all opt for option two. And option two says, hey, go ahead and take the taxes out as additional taxes. And so on the actual W-4 form, the pastor would give this to the uh, person that's in charge of payroll at your house of worship and say, could you just take this extra amount out? And I think Ken said, it's a good idea um, requesting that additional tax to be withheld, that 14.3%, 14.13% um, be taken out as additional tax. So you take your housing allowance times 14.13%, and then now at least you know that you're covered there. Uh, states also have a similar form if your state has state income tax. Um, they also have an option for um, you to say, I want additional state taxes withheld. So in case of Pennsylvania, you're going to pay your uh, state tax on not only box one, but on box 14 income, you need to make sure that you're um, covering yourself um, there. And this is where things get so confusing for people. So having a good tax advisor is really, 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 really important. Okay. I know, I know several pastors, um, actually, just in the last year, sadly, that um, did their their payroll, their, or I'm sorry, their um, personal tax return incorrectly. And um, one of them paid no SE tax. I'm like, um, yeah, you owe that money in on SE tax. And, he, and the interesting thing was his house of worship actually tried to help him and said, you need to have this amount taken out of every paycheck so that you're covered for both your um, federal and your SE tax for federal um, tax purposes. He did that. He had the amount withheld, got like a $10,000 refund, and then spent it. 
never questioning why would they have told me to have this amount withhold, withheld, and then I would get it back from the IRS, right? So it was a very, it was a really sad conversation to have, and it was very lengthy because he, the, the house of worship tried to help him, but they didn't ever see him actually do his personal return. So be really careful about that. Yeah, and it just it, it is confusing, Barbara, too, because like if you're a, if you if you understand W twos, then you know that box two is where you typically put the withholding for income tax, mm -hmm. and box four and six is where you put the withholding for half of the Social Security and Medicare tax. Right. Well, for a pastor, if the pastor says, "Well, you're supposed to," the pastor is supposed to either pay the the taxes in um through estimates which is you know the option one with the estimated mm -hmm. tax payments but if they want the church to do it and they want the church to pay enough in to cover both the federal and the social security medicare or self-employment tax you got to put the whole thing in box two which is weird but that's the way it works, you know. Well, it, it is weird, but if you think about it from the IRS's standpoint, the IRS doesn't care how they get their money. They just want to know that if, when you add your SE tax and your income tax calculation on your Form 1040 and your total tax line, let's say, says $6,000, they're happy to see that in box two that you've taken $6,000 out to cover it. Because and we'll that's get, what's going to come in to the with what was withheld to cover your total taxes. Well, let's let's um, move on. Yep. Um, yep. So Cindy yep. is this is a great idea, Cindy. She's like, this should be a separate webinar. We should have a webinar for pastors on their individual taxes. That's yeah. what we should do. Yeah, but anyway. it's interesting you should say that. Yeah, I did a um, yeah, I did a whole um, in my goes to our church academy. I actually did this. Um, webinar over three one-hour sessions because we and then and then we said and we still need to do one on personal on the personal pastor side of the, you know the other side of the pulpit let's go on the other side of the pulpit we're talking about the house of worship thing but um, yeah totally I agree so we you. could do that in December um, before yeah. they decide for next year and then um, and then the operations admin is asking the question that's about to come up, I think. But let's do the setup in QuickBooks first, and then we'll okay. finish out with. Yeah. So somebody asked, are you going to show us what it looks like in QuickBooks? So um, yeah. So if you are using QuickBooks as your payroll uh, program in the desktop version, we're talking about the desktop version, you're going to go to the um, employees record to the payroll info tab. You're going to put in the clergy uh, salary as earnings. You're going to put the housing allowance as an additional an addition to that compensation. If you have an, like an auto allowance, a non-accountable allowance, like an auto allowance, you would put that also in as an addition to compensation. Um, then you would click on the little tax button at the top of the payroll info screen. And this screen will pop up. And under federal, um, you can see that this particular pastor is saying, don't withhold and don't give me any extra withholding. The key on this little pop-up though, is you need to uncheck Medicare, Social Security, and federal unemployment tax because um, churches are not subject to federal unemployment for any, by the way, any of their employees. So all of their employees should have the um, federal unemployment um, uh, tax unchecked because they are not subject to federal unemployment but pastors need to have um, the Medicare and the Social Security also unchecked. On the um, online, oh, and this, I just, um, that point was because this person has no extra withholding, that's an indication that they're going to do option one, which is um, the estimated quarterly payments. Okay, QuickBooks online setup is a little bit different. Um, they also have the pay types, which put the salary in, we put the amount of cash housing. This is um, uh, not in kind. So uh, QuickBooks Online uh, distinguishes between clergy housing cash, where you're giving them an allowance, versus clergy housing in kind, which is your parsonage allowance, that you uh, the value of that parsonage. And then um, also, if there are any allowances, like a $300 um, auto allowance, you can add that as well. 
Um, then we go into the withholding section. Under the federal withholding, you have the opportunity to add extra withholding if you want to. And um, just kind of, it's like complete opposite of what we did in the desktop. This one is saying, what are you exempt from? So instead of unchecking it, you actually need to check mark the things that you are not, um, that you're exempt from. So in the case of a pastor, they're exempt from Social Security and Medicare because they're going to pay SE tax instead. And it, um, QuickBooks makes a big point about that, that this is not common. So uh, be careful about um, whether you're selecting that. And again, is this only applies um, to pastor. This one says AZ, state unemployment in, this, in the state of Arizona. Um, we, uh, we are not subject to state unemployment as well. So just, um, and that's different in every state too, just by the way. All right, um, any quick questions on that? Otherwise we are going to move out on to the final section, which is opting out of SE taxes, okay? Um, so what oh, we'll, we'll just to let them know. It on my online version. Okay, so Susan, you're asking about where to find the QuickBooks online. If you have your payroll through QuickBooks online, um, you would go to the employee's record and then there's a bunch of different sections. There, you have the section on the, um, let me just go back here quick. You'll have the section on the pay types and you'll have the section on the tax withholding. That's where you'll find that. Okay, if you're not using QuickBooks payroll, then it doesn't matter. You're gonna have, you're gonna have your payroll outside of that. So yeah, you wouldn't see it if you're not subscribed to the um, payroll module. Okay, perfect. All right. All right, so let's move on to opting out of SE taxes. Um, I'm going to just right from the beginning, I'm just going to say that I think this is a very dangerous place to be, but I want to just tell you what this is. So there is a form called a Form 4361. This form creates an irrevocable election between the pastor and the IRS, and it only covers church compensation. Um, what the form says is that the pastor is conscientiously opposed to the acceptance of things like Social Security, Medicare, uh, temporary assistance for needy families, food stamps, and WIC. Well, let me go back to that. The reason that I think this is dangerous and the reason that I think this is really important to think about is that as a pastor, you are shepherding um, your congregation, right? So if somebody comes to you and says, I can't make ends meet and I don't have any food to eat, and you're seeing they're saying, well, I'm conscientiously, and granted, it's a personal decision, I'm conscientiously opposed to the acceptance of food stamps, but then you're turning around and shepherding your flock to do that. That seems a little bit out of integrity. Um, it also is the, when you get to age 65, it's amazing how many people have opted out of Social Security and Medicare because they were conscientiously opposed, but at 65, they have this epiphany that, they actually should take Social Security and Medicare. So just mentioning that, because this is what you're saying, that you're conscientiously opposed to that. There are five steps for opting out. You have to first qualify. And the, um, the way that you qualify is that you have a conscientious opposition to the acceptance of those things that I just mentioned. You have to file the Form 4361, and you have to file it in a timely manner. Um, and there's a whole thing on how, um, the timing of that, it has to be within the first two years of receiving um, $400 in uh, compensation as a pastor. You have to inform your church. You don't have to inform the payroll department, by the way, because they don't really care um, about it. They don't have, the payroll department isn't gonna change what they're doing. They're not going to withhold Social Security and Medicare from your paycheck. So they don't need to know, but your board needs to know. And the board needs to know and the board needs to be informed because you are um, relinquishing your, um, you're going to uh, reduce your SE taxes being paid in, and that could affect what happens later um, when all of a sudden you realize that your Social Security and Medicare uh, benefits at age 65 are less than you expect. Um, uh, you have to verify, you have to come back and say, yep, I really am conscientiously opposed to the acceptance of those things. And then you receive um, approval from the IRS. And at that point, um, uh, 
and actually you, um, I believe that you can actually not pay in on the assumption that the IRS is going to approve this. And um, most of the time, I, I don't, um, I think most of the time you get approval because if you think about it, the IRS just is not going to have to pay as much out to you later because you're not paying anything in. So just keep that in mind. Um, but I wanna just, again, I, I, I just think it's a dangerous thing to be in this position because you're signing this form under penalties of perjures, perjury that, um, and I'm gonna say it again, a pastor can only opt out if they can truthfully state, I am conscientiously opposed or because of my religious principles, I am opposed to the acceptance of public insurance that makes payments in the event of death, disability, old age or retirement, doesn't that sound like social security? Or that makes payments towards the cost or provide services for medical care. Doesn't that sound like Medicare? So you're saying that I'm opposed to all of that. And that's why when you get to age 65 and you find and you have this epiphany to accept it, it seems a bit out of integrity to me. Um, claiming an exemption from the SE tax cannot be for economic reasons. If you read the instructions on the form 4361, it says that really clearly. You can't go, oh, well, you know, I'm going to say 14.13 effective rate, um, percent of effective rate. So I'm just going to fill out this form. It is irrevocable. You can't come back and go, oops, didn't mean to do that. So you're, once you're approved, it's irrevocable. For the rest of your life. For the rest of your life for, for your church compensation. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that was somebody Debbie had asked and a couple of other people, other jobs that you have, you can still get the withholding. Yes, um, you would still, but, correct. But, but just not the church job. But what happens when you retire then? What happens so, to the social security that you paid to other jobs? Yes, that's a great question. Um, you still, and this is where I'm saying it's kind of an epiphany. They, um, you go at age 65, if you have your quarters in, if you've got, um, if you have enough non-ministerial wages and you've earned 40 credits, just like you have to do anyway, as any other um, uh, employee, um, you are entitled to the benefits, but you're only entitled to the benefits on, on the compensation that you pay those taxes on. So if you worked as a barista um, or you have a second job where they're withholding the taxes and you accumulate enough credits, yes, you can, um, you, you can actually claim your, um, your normal Social Security and Medicare, but it's going to be reduced a lot if you're in the ministry for a long period of time. Um, also, if your spouse has earned the credits, they're, um, uh, they're also eligible um, for their Social Security. So it doesn't you know, kind of uh, pull over. Um, but here's what the point that I want to make here, though, is if you decide to file a 4361, you have to realize that, you, and let's say that you actually do qualify for a little bit of Social Security because you had another job before um, you became a pastor, you're going to have to make up for the difference, right? So that 14.13% effective rate that you did not put into Social Security, um, you're going to be, you need to take at least that same percentage, put it towards retirement. You're not going to, um, if you're, a, if you've been a pastor your whole life, especially these young pastors that are filling this out, they become a pastor and they're a pastor and they don't ever earn their 40 credits. Life insurance, if you think about it, if you don't get your social security, your spouse doesn't get their spousal benefits. If you're disabled, you don't get disability benefits. That's part of the FICA, the old age and disability benefit is, um, so you better have your own disability insurance. Better have a health savings account to help pay for those expenses um, down the road and long-term care. Because long-term care insurance, if you don't have long-term care insurance and you're not gonna get Medicaid when you get older, you're gonna need long-term care insurance. So all of this falls into play and then you kind of have to kind of scratch your head and go, okay, remember we're not supposed to do this for economic reasons anyway, but the point is that that, 15%, 7.65% that you would have had withheld anyway, if you had been a typical employee, is paying for all of these things for you and your family. So I just want, I, I want to make sure that this is. And again, clear. this is, 
This is yeah. something that the, that the pastor decides, but it's yes. something that, uh, and you don't even really have to change what you do in terms right. of reporting because they're the one doing it anyway, but we put it on here because we felt like it was important. So we we're over by like six oh. minutes. So oh, sorry. Did, did, okay. Anything I, else think I'm, I, I think I'm actually um, done with that. Um, yeah, so as a, just real quickly, um, we talked about this before. Um, even if you opted out of SE taxes, if you have other type of um, like got honorariums from another um, church, you'd still have to file the SE tax. So um, just that if you have $400 or more of other net earnings from self-employment, they need to go on the SE tax and um, useful resources. Uh, Carol, you asked minister's audit techniques guide is um, from the IRS. And then also publication 517 is a really good resource as well. Um, do you want to talk about this really quickly? And yeah, if you could up. stop sharing, I'll show them. But I think you have to stop sharing. Oh, stop share. Okay. Yep. All right. Go ahead. Thanks. So I'm going to share. Um, so uh, I am at our website, which is QuickBook Made Easy for Nonprofits. And I know a lot of you are already customers, but I think a lot of you are new. Um, and if you go into courses and training and you go to webinars, you will see a webinar just for Houses of Worship. It's September the 14th. It's a two-day series. So it's September the 14th and 15th. And then um, just for people that are using QuickBooks desktop, it's going to show you everything you need to know about how to use QuickBooks. That's 199 If you are using QuickBooks online, September 21st and 22nd, um, that's when we're doing it for QuickBooks online. It's two hours, well, probably two and a half hours a day for the two days. And um, this is some of the stuff that is gonna be in there, but we're gonna go through everything. How to handle designated funds, meaningful reports, um, how to enter income, chart of accounts, data entry, tracking ministry expenses. It's the only training that exists just for QuickBooks users with Houses of Worship, okay? So, and yes, you do get a discount. Um, the discount that you get, uh, where did I put it? Um, Do you want me to share my screen real quick? Well, I think I've got it here. Okay. Um, I'll just go back to the end here. Um, that's probably making me sick. Uh, but it's $199 normally. And I'm just getting to where the coupon is, the little discount coupon. <laughs> uh, and I should have done that at the beginning instead of the end. Okay. All right. So it's normally $199. We're giving you 30 days or $30 off. So when you sign up, it's TS30 off. TS30 off. That's the little coupon code at checkout, and you'll get it for $169. Um, again, it says it's two to four. I think we're going to make it a little longer. Um, but that's the desktop users on the 14th and the 15th. And then the next week is the online users. Um, if you are somebody that likes to learn on your own, that training, that live training is a smaller portion of the on-demand training. And if you go to on-demand, this is streamable training. Here's one just for houses of worship. Um, it teaches you more than what we'll be getting live. Um, you can either get it in online or desktop. Either one is normally $299. We are going to give it to you for uh, two sixty nine. We're giving you thirty dollars off of that. TS thirty off. TS thirty off. And then finally, if you would rather just talk to us and just have technical support, and you can call Barbara or myself. We, you call a tech support number. We can even create appointments. Dial in. We can help you with whatever you want. We can give you a year of tech support that's normally four ninety nine. For $2.99. You can call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'm the one who usually answers on the weekends, by the way. Uh, although, Barb, you've been answering on the weekends uh, as well yep. lately. And to get to that, you go to tech support and um, you click on year and you click on the version you have. It's normally $4.99. If you put this code in, TSTS299, you'll get $200 off. All right. These coupon codes are good until Saturday night, okay? They're good until Saturday night, all right? So um, I think that's everything. 
So Debbie asked a question, if you currently have desktop version, but have not uh, used the payroll portion, would we need a different version? 2016 isn't that much different than 2022, to be honest. So you're fine. Um, and we're not and we're not going into the payroll anyway. This is more about the just how do you set up your house of worship, get meaningful reports, create accountability, um, you know, kind of soup to nuts if you're a do-it-yourselfer and you're like, I gotta start this thing um, over, or I wanna um, you know, revamp under uh, using my methodology for designated restricted funds, uh, you'll get everything that you need, either in the two-day or in the downloadable training product. But 2016 works fine. Okay. All right. All right. Well, I will. Um, I think that'll be it. Uh, uh, did you want to finish this out, Aretha? Um, yeah. So as, uh, just real quickly, Debbie's saying, how would you report uh, deductions for payroll? Um, we do go into that, how you report payroll in QuickBooks on, in both the two-day and in that. I am so blessed to um, have this privilege to do this webinar Thank you everybody for attending. Thank you for your great questions. That helps us a lot and um, have an incredible day and do great things in your houses of worship.